is good, okay. So yeah, you did have lunch, correct? Um, which is, we'll see about that. So um, thank you very much for, for being here and for the organizers for, for making you know, all this uh, thing happen. And of course, for inviting me as well. Uh, so I flew in from Singapore, that's, that's where I'm based, um, and I work for a company called Cloudinary. And we're going to talk about web performance in relation to images on the web, okay? Now, before I start, here's a quick question for you. Who has heard about this paradigm before? Fresh body, fit mind. One. There's always like one or two, which is very bad, but it's fine. So, fresh body, fit mind. So what that means is in order for your brain to work, well, you're supposed to do some exercises, right? So exercises help those brain juices going. And given the fact that you had lunch and I need you to be 100% sharp and focused, we're going to exercise. So let's all stand up. I'm not even kidding. So every time I, so it's very funny. So every time I do these talks, I see half of the people are like, they stand up like, yes. The other half are like, I'm not really. Okay, so it's going to be a very simple exercise. Okay, I'll show you and I'll show you my back, so apologies for that. So what you need to do is lift up your arms so that your elbow is in line with your eyes, both of them. Yep, 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 okay, you know, it's like a little bit of a stretch. Open up your palms, both of them, and put them together repeatedly very fast. Yeah, yeah, like clap, like clap, yeah, 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 come on. All right. That's the exercise. Okay, so, <laughs> what happens is, <laughs> I collect these pictures, because I'm a freak. <laughs> I go to my boss, <clears throat> show the pictures, and he's like, you've been to a technical conference, right? I'm like, yeah. You talked about tech, yeah? To developers, yeah? And they stand up and give you a standing ovation, and they clap, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, that's how you get the bonus. So just FYI, okay? Right, so, jokes apart. <laughs> um, so I'm here to talk to you about web performance and, and image optimization, essentially. So we're going to start off with this notion that today we live in the age of what I like to label as the visual web, right? So if you think about it, websites that you, you visit today, they have images, they have videos, there's a lot of visual elements going on, so it's very, very, difficult to actually find a website where you have zero images, okay? So it's really the visual web that we, uh, we live in. And I read this somewhere, which I thought is really, really interesting, that, you know, someone said that instead of, you know, HTML being just, you know, hypertext, we are now living in the age of sort of hypermedia, where you have lots of images, videos, lots of content, animation, etc., etc. Now, just to back this claim, I don't know how many of you heard of the Web Almanac project. Okay, do check it out. There's going to be a link at the end of the slides. So Web Almanac essentially uh, takes a look at the HTTP archive data and then every year they produce a report based on the most important finding or more, most interesting findings from HTTP archive, okay? And then the Web Almanac report has about 16 or maybe 20 chapters. One chapter dedicated to JavaScript, HTML, CSS, SEO, HTTP, and then I think chapter six or seven is about media. And so in the 2022 report, um, we found that about 99.9% .9 of the websites that are present in the HTTP archive data, which is quite a you know, large number of sites, of course, would generate a request for an image resource, right? So that's 99.9% .9 of the sites, which pretty much tells us that yes, every single website out there makes a request to uh, an image resource of some sort. Now at Cloudinary, so obviously you know we we also do you know lots of image optimization and delivery. So we've created our own report as well, and we found that on average last year we s basically handled 199 billion requests for images. Okay, so let's just let that number sink in. That's 199 billion per month image requests. That actually excludes requests for videos. Okay, so clearly there's a lot of traffic going on in terms of images. Now, of course, you know, there are a lot of discussions about web performance these days, right? Everyone wants to create sites that perform well. And, you know, most of the discussions are about, you know, how do I load this? How do I, you know, generate statically that? How do I reduce my JavaScript? And often the discussion about images is neglected, right? Because no one thinks about images when it comes to web performance, but as a matter of fact, images are the largest and heaviest resource that you have on any given website, 
Okay, so you may have one megabyte of JavaScript or a two megabyte JavaScript bundle, but if you have 10 images, five kilo, or 500 kilobytes each, that's going to be a lot heavier um, on your site. So when optimizing you know, websites, images are often neglected or images are optimized incorrectly. So what that means, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And just to sort of back this, there's, I don't know how many of you um, know this guy, goes by the name of Anya Vatica. So he tweets about you know, web performance related stuff. And um, earlier this year, I found two of his tweets that are very, very relevant to what I'm talking about today, which is, you know, first he analyzed Beyonce.com, but it doesn't really matter which site he talks about here. But he found that, you know, there was one megabyte of, um, of JavaScript, which is, you know, quite a lot. But then he says, well, the rest of the weight for the overall website came from images, right? So we see Beyonce's website is full of images and videos. And it's, it's a lot of stuff that could essentially have a negative impact on the website. And it's not the JavaScript, it's the images. Another example, again, I'm, I'm forgetting which site he was talking about here, is that there were, you know, a, a 33 second LCP. Now what LCP is, is something that we're going to talk about um, uh, later on. And there were, you know, 200 plus requests for images. There was 2.5 megabytes of JavaScript, but there was also a 13 megabyte PNG. Right, which this particular site tried to load. So those are the things that we are kind of neglecting and not focusing on enough because, well, I don't know why, but, but hopefully after this talk, you'll go to your site and, and check out the images that you have um, and, and see if you can optimize them. So why is image optimization so important, right? Why, why are we talking about this and why am I not here talk, telling you about, you know, how to create performing JavaScript? The reason being is because of this thing called core web vitals. So who here has heard about core web vitals? Hmm. Okay, three. Um, so, so what we're going to do is, is talk about core web vitals. In particular, we're going to talk about one of the metrics called largest contentful pane. So what is core web vitals or what are core web vitals? Core web vitals are essentially three metrics that were introduced by Google um, and more importantly, the result from these three metrics, as of today, directly impacts search page ranking. So maybe you know, two years ago, search page ranking was essentially um, done based on a couple of factors. Uh, I'm not an SEO expert, but it was you know, freshness of content, relevancy of content, you know, whether your site uses HTTPS and, and some other things. As of today, the three core web vital metrics, out of which largest content full paint is, is one, the results that you get will also impact your search page ranking, i.e. if your site loads slowly, for example, that is going to have a negative impact on your search page ranking results. So what are the three metrics? So largest contentful paint is, is one of them. Um, we're going to talk about this uh, in detail. Then you have the cumulative layout shift. So I don't have slides on that, but just in, in a nutshell, cumulative layout shift is basically measuring how much the content on a particular page moves or jumps around. Okay, so classic example, you open up a website or a news page, you start reading it on your mobile or on your, on your computer, and then out of nowhere an advert comes in between two paragraphs and now whew, the content shifts, right? Very annoying, very difficult to, to then find what you were looking at, very distracting to the user. So essentially what Google said, well, if the content moves a lot, then it's going to be you know, penalizing that site. Um, so that's that, then there's the um, first input delay, which is currently active now, but as of March 2014, it's going to be replaced by another metric called interaction to interact INP, interaction to next paint, I think. But both of these are trying to measure how interactive your site is, okay? So for example, first input delay today measures a very classic scenario where Again, you go to the website, you tap into a, an input field of some sort, or you, you know, you, on, on your computer, you try to search something or, or enter some text into an input field, you type, nothing happens, and then a couple of milliseconds later, the entire thing shows up, right? So clearly there was a, a delay with the interaction. So again, if your interaction is, I, I'm forgetting what the scale is, but if it's not in a, you know, like a zero to 100 millisecond um, um, range, then, Google is going to penalize you on that. And then we arrive to the third one, which is largest contentful paint. So largest contentful paint is essentially a metric that measures how much time the largest visible element on the page took to load, 
Okay, and this is the, the metric that you're, that you're looking at. So anything that loads between zero and 2.5 seconds, that's good. 2.5 to four, you need to look into that. Four seconds and above, you're providing a poor loading experience for a user, so you need to change something. Now, what are the elements? Or actually, so one more slide here. So uh, essentially, you know, the Cobra Vital metrics have been around for a couple of years now. And then Google started to collect all these statistics about, you know, how after the announcement, how well sites try to implement solutions to, you know, have better cumulative layout chips, have better first input delays, and have better LCP scores. And then out of these three uh, metrics, they found that the largest content pool paint is the one that developers struggle with the most. Okay, so that's, there's an article that, um, that talks about this. So I'm going to talk about the LCP today. And I'm also going to talk about how to improve your LCP score because, in fact, the LCP calculation is a result of four subcalculations, and we're going to take about take a look about the, take a look at those four subcalculations, and then see how you can improve your performance, especially for LCP. So, what does LCP measure? So, essentially, it measures the render time of the largest visible element on the page. Okay, so what does it mean, visible element? It means that when the site loads, they just look at the content which is above the fold. Okay, so the element needs to be visible. But what are those elements that they measure? So, you know, image elements. So that's straightforward. Image elements inside an SVG. They also measure the video element, but only if the video element has a poster attribute. So they don't actually measure the load time for the video itself, but only if there's a poster attribute added to the video. Then they also measure elements that have a background image that you load via the URL property. And if, the, if you don't have any images on, on the um, visible uh, first load, then they're going to measure how long block uh, level text elements took to load. So an H1 or a paragraph or a span or whatever. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much it. Um, a recent change, um, this is of Chrome 112, LCP no longer, so it's the LCP used to measure you know, any image. So if there was an image on the, um, on the page above the fold, it was, the, it was used for the calculation, but it's no longer true, okay? So as of Chrome 112, only um, high entropy, so, so low entropy images are ignored. So I hear you ask, oh, Tamash, what's low entropy? Thanks for the question. So that's low entropy, or that's entropy. Um, I don't know what that means. Um, N1 pi log, pff, another pi, I don't know. Um, but, but I have a description for you. I'll, I'll tell you what, what it is in a very simple, uh, simple way. So essentially, uh, entropy in, in, in images would try to measure the complexity of the information found in the image itself. Okay? So essentially, think of a low entropy image as being, you know, maybe there's a, a, a brick house and, and maybe a, a blue sky, right? There's going to be a, a really low entropy image compared that with a, uh, a picture of a photo where there's a stream and bees and birds and very fine detail stuff, right? So that would be a high entropy image. Now, the good news is that there's an actual script uh, that you can run in Chrome DevTools as a snippet, or you can you know, just copy this into, uh, into your console. So this particular script would actually measure the entropy of your images, and then based on this, you would see which image is low or high entropy. So if you want, and if you're curious, just to do a test on your site, you can run this script and it will tell you which images would fall under the low or the high entropy uh, image categories. Okay, so you understand that there's this thing called LCP, so the question is how do you know, you know what your LCP score is? How do you start measuring it? And of course, usually the first answer that comes to mind is, is Lighthouse. So that's a good start because you know Lighthouse is very accessible, it's very easy to use, it's part of Chrome, DevTools, there's a tab, you, you run a test and it's fine. But I would not recommend you to do that more than once or twice. It's really good to get a feel for how performant your site is, but one of the, uh, the it's not really a problem, but one of the, the way Lighthouse works is that, you know, obviously it uses your network connection, it uses your, your available resources on your, on your machine, and so running the Lighthouse report on any given site on different laptops would give us different results. So it's not really meaningful and it's not really going to give us a definitive answer in terms of is this site performing well, is the LCP score good or not. So what you need to rely on 
is the so-called um, RAM data, real user metric data. Now, one of the websites uh, that I would recommend for you to use is PageSpeed. Okay, so PageSpeed Insights, which is PageSpeed or Web of Dev. <coughs> the great thing about that is, you know, you enter your website URL and you're going to get a report that looks exactly the same as Lighthouse, but there's going to be one very important difference, which I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, but there are some other things that you can use, such as, you know, if you, if you like to code things up, then there's the Performance Observer API, which can measure LCP, cumulative layout shifts, and, and essentially all the Cover Vital stuff. There's also, I didn't put this on, but there's also a Cover Vitals JavaScript library that you can, you know, start using in your page. And there is a thing inside DevTools called the Core Web Vitals Overlay, which I'll show you a little bit later. So what is the difference between just running Lighthouse and running PageSpeed Insights? And the difference is this very first section, and I try to highlight the, the most important things here, but essentially PageSpeed Insights will take data for the last 28 days, and it's going to be data coming from real users. Okay, so this is your definitive, um, these are the definitive measurements that you have because if you look at the number here and you see your LCP is 1.4, you will know that your real users in the past 28 days had, had no issues with your largest content of the page. Okay? This is, remember, this is real user data, right? So this is the data that should be your, uh, your reference. Okay, so <clears throat> you get an LCP score and let's say it's a bad one. So what do you do next? What, what can you do next? So as I mentioned earlier, the LCP calculation is actually made up of four subcalculations or four sort of sub-values, really. Uh, those are time to first byte, resource load delay, resource load time, and element render delay. Meaning, if you happen to reduce your time to first byte or basically change any of these values, it means that your overall LCP score is also going to be improved. Now, I also show a sort of chart on the bottom of this slide. Where that's coming from is something that I'll show you, but it's uh, part of an experimental um, uh, DevTools panel called Performance Insights, but I'm going to run that as part of a demo uh, uh, soon. So let's go through each of these, right? So time to first byte, right? So time to first byte is essentially when you go to a URL, you hit enter, and, and it's the time when the server sends the first byte. So it's the time between the request and the, the browser receiving the very first byte. Now, out of these things, you know, these are all important points, and, and these are all valid in terms of how to improve your time to first byte, but I think I'm, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the last one, because these days we hear a lot about you know, server-side rendering server-side render this, server-side component that, server-side, server-side, blah, blah, blah. Now, the problem, so server-side rendering obviously has its use cases and, 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 it's, and it's valid, and, and I'm not trying to say that, hey, you should not use that, but if you try to improve your LCP score, then you need to, well, you shouldn't be using server-side rendering, essentially, okay? Because if you think about it, you, you enter, you go to a website, that you make a request to a server, the server is going to then generate the HTML for you, it's going to pull data, et cetera, et cetera, and it's going to send that data back in the form of HTML to the requesting browser. So that time that it takes to collect the data, construct the HTML, is going to prolong your time to first byte, which subsequently will prolong your LCP score. So if you want to have a faster time to first byte, then you should do pre-rendering or static site generation of your HTML if you can. Um, and there are some, you know, other tips here, which uh, obviously um, makes sense. I think the, uh, the the one that I really liked is predictive prefetching. I don't know if you've heard about the library called GasGS. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember the year that this was released. Uh, so GasGS is a uh, is a Google um, it's a Google library. I think twenty. 17, 18, or 19, one of these years they, they introduced that. And the, what it does, it's, it's very ingenious, I think. Um, so the notion of predictive prefetching is, uh, so do you know what prefetching is? There's a prefetch client hint, right? So you can say on any given website, you can have a prefetch uh, header in the form of a link element that says you're on index.html and prefetch about.html. And then in, once index.html finishes to load, 
the browser will make a request and, and grab the details of about.html, okay? So then when you go to about.html, it, it would have already done some of the work that it requires to generate a page. Now, projective prefetching with guest.js essentially takes that to the next level whereby you take this guest.js library and you hook it up with your Google Analytics account. So Analytics has a lot of data about you know, where the visitor comes from, what, what pages they visit. Essentially, with guest.js, they can build up user profiles, okay? And then they use machine learning to predictively prefetch resources. So they know that you know, this type of user from this region went from the home page to the news page. And so they will say, okay, the same profile user comes in, they're going to predictively prefetch the news page, okay? So th that's what guest.js is trying to do, which I think is really, really um, cool. So time to first byte, check. Um, read your, uh, reduce resource load delay. Um, so essentially what you're trying to do here is make sure that the LCP candidate is discoverable by the browser as soon as possible, okay? So if you have, you know, very complex HTML structures and stuff, then the, the, and let's say the LCP is an image, the image shouldn't be, you know, the very last thing that your HTML loads. So ideally your goal is to try to load the LCP resource as soon as possible. In fact, I'm going to go as far as saying is I try to load the LCP as the second resource after your, your HTML, okay? If you can. Now, um, obviously, so there's this thing called the fetch priority high um, attribute, which you can add um, in the header as part of a link element, or you can also add it to, as an attribute to your image element. Uh, not all browsers support it, but even though, you know, maybe, you know, it's, it's good practice to add it, but if you don't want to or you can't add that to your image element, then try to make sure that your HTML structure is structured in a way that the image element is discoverable very, very fast and the browser can start downloading it as soon as possible. So try to reduce that resource load delay. And then the other one, resource load time, I think this is the um, sort of more straightforward one. Essentially, this means that you, you should try to reduce the size of the, you know, we talk about images, the size of the image, right? So if the image is two megabytes, it's going to take a lot of time to uh, transfer over the network. And so the smaller the resource is, the less time it's going to uh, take for the network uh, to, to send it through. Um, so obviously you can, you can do this via, you know, CDN optimization. Um, and the reason why I have an asterisk there is because a lot of people would say, well, if you use the same origin, then by default, your resource load time is going to be reduced. That is correct, right? Because if you use the same origin, so if the image is in the same origin as the, as the site itself, then it's going to load faster. The reason why I say CDN optimization here with the asterisk is because some of the image CDNs or these image services would give you additional things that you can do to optimize your images is that maybe it's beneficial to use that and then not use the same origin. But be aware of the fact that you, know, you would have to test both scenarios. <clears throat> and also very important that in the scenario where the, where the LCP element is not an image, but it's a paragraph, then the way you load your fonts would also become very relevant, okay? Because the LCP, the overall LCP calculation is going to take the, uh, is going to take the, the font um, loading into consideration as well, okay? So it will wait until the paragraph is rendered with the applicable font and that's the whole thing that is going to be measured, okay? But it's very, it, it's very rare that LCP would be text because in modern UX practice, the best practices, you would have like a hero image of some sort or, a, you know, an image is going to be at all times larger than just text. And then the last one, uh, trying to reduce the element render delay. So essentially, this is the last step in the process, right? So we made the request that, you know, we received the image uh, through, the, through the network. And now what you need to make sure is that you load that image as soon as possible, sorry, you display that image as soon as possible, okay? Now, obviously there are some things about CSS, you know, you shouldn't have render blocking CSS. Try to defer your, your JavaScript if you can. But most importantly, never, ever, ever, never, ever, ever, ever 
I, I'm saying this because now you pay attention. Like, what's wrong with him? Uh, <laughs> so don't lazy load the LCP element, okay? If you apply lazy loading to the image, that's just going to prolong your, your LCP score, and then you will always get a bad score. Now, unfortunately enough, things like Shopify, um, they automatically lazy load all your, your images. There you go, so you can't do anything about that. Um, Astro, if you, if you use it, now release an image component, and I tried my best to convince them not to do this, but they still do that, so by default, if you just use the image element in Astro, it will apply, it will automatically lazy load the image, unless you explicitly tell it not to, okay? Um, I was at a conference, it was funny, I was, I was saying this, never ever lazy load the LCP element, and I mentioned Astro, and then I saw a guy somewhere in the back, like opening the laptop, I'm like, hmm, okay, he's bored. Um, and then after the talk, he came to me and he said, you know what, I couldn't figure out why my LCP was bad, and, I, and he used Astro, and then he didn't realize that Astro just, you know, automatically lazy loads the images, then he changed it, and then his LCP was in the green, and he was like, whew, finally. So, so just understand that, right? So lazy loading is good for, for places when the images are not visible, but if the image is the LCP candidate, do not lazy load that, please. Okay, so what are the things you can do to, you know, to optimize your images? So you can use the so-called next-gen image formats. So what are next-gen image formats? AVIF, WebP, JPEG XL, JPEG 2000. So anything that's not a JPEG or a PNG is good enough. Um, and do not, so, so a lot of times, uh, and I've seen this, I have live examples, but I don't want to performance shame any, any website. But um, there are websites out there today that make a request to an image that is like 2,000 by 1,500 pixels in size, um, and then they resize that in CSS to be 200 by 150. I mean, really? And yes, really, they, they do that, right? So each image, I have an example where there's a carousel of images, there's six images, five or six images, and each is like two megabytes because they load the large image and they shrink it in CSS. So do not use CSS to resize your images. Um, I think there's a link uh, at the end to this as well. So at Cloudin, we created this uh, card called the Battle of Codecs. Um, and what we've done, what my colleague has done, because this isn't me, so what my colleagues have done is, um, is they took the, the most common image formats, including the next-gen image formats that are out there today, so you know, from JPEG to JPEG XL, um, and they compared their functionalities and capabilities across a couple of dimensions, right? So how well they compress photos and other images. How is the encoding and decoding speed? It's very important to understand this because you know, you may have, you may see that, you know, AVIFs are very performant and it's really, really great. However, you need to also understand that the encoding and decoding speed of AVIF is actually very, very slow. It's slower than anything else. And so, if you think about it, you know, you may produce an AVIF or you try to create this on your own, or you try to display it, and you will not understand why is it loading, you know, why is it still loading slow? And it's because of the encoding and decoding speed. In fact, at Cloudinary, we, I think there's a limit. So if the image is more than 4,000 or 5,000 pixels in, in, in width, we will not generate an AVIF, purely because the amount of time it takes to do that and the amount of resources it takes to do that is just, uh, you know, it's, it's not beneficial anymore. Um, also, do understand that JPEG, which is the, again, you can refer to Web Almanac, is the most wide, widely used image format out there today on the web, but it's from 1992, right? And as such, and in fact, JPEG was never created for the web, okay? So it has certain features that are great for the web, but the next-gen image formats, like the WebP, the AVIF, and especially JPEG XL, are much better fitted for, um, for the web, okay? And there's some other dimensions, like limits and features and animation, whether it supports transparency, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so <clears throat> what I've done I've created this, um, this is just a demo app, which I never actually finished, but, but it works for presentation purposes. Um, so what you will see now, this is going to be a video which I'll play in, in just a second, but what you will see now is that I have selected three image formats, right? So WebP, AVIF, and Progressive JPEG. And what you will see is the same image loaded 
uh, where there's going to be one image where each part of the image is going to be loaded according to that image format that you selected, right? So there's going to be a WebP part, an AVIF part, and a Progressive JPEG part. What we will see is that the AVIF image is going to load the fastest because that's the, you know, that's the most optimized, that's going to be the smaller one, then it's going to be the WebP, then it's going to be the Progressive JPEG. Now the problem is that, for example, AVIF, and so is WebP, but that's beside the points, but, but, but AVIF is, is an image format that was created from the AV1 video codec, okay? And as such, it has certain limitations. One of the limitations is that even though it's going to load the you know, fastest, you will not see anything. You're just going to see a white box and then boom, the full blown picture is going to be loaded. If that's what you want, it's great, but understand how it is different from say a progressive JPEG, which you will also see there, with the progressive JPEG, what you will see is that we will see the image loaded and then progressively the higher quality version of the JPEG will be loaded, okay? But then we will see that something is happening. Now, you need to understand this because if you don't care about the fact that your users will see just a white box for a while and then they will see the image fast, then that's fine. But, but do you, you know, understand this? Okay, so you see the JPEG is already there nothing for the AVIF and then boom it loads and the WebP also shows nothing because it also has been derived from uh, video codec. Okay, and I changed to PNG which would also tell you never to use PNGs because they are just slow. Okay, and this is using, I think I throttled to a 3G connection or something. Um, there's also another question about fidelity of the images um, but I won't have time to talk about that but, but anyway, so so yeah, just make sure that you understand how these image formats work, even though they are next gen and they, you know, actually Lighthouse is also encouraging you to, to use them. Just make sure that if, if you go with an AVIF or if you go with a WebP that, that you maybe do, uh, I don't know, you show something for your users indicating that the image is actually loading as opposed to just leaving them with the white box. Um, this is a, a very last minute addition to my slides. So, um, I know this is a Google event, and I'm going to talk about the Apple event here. Um, I'm brave, like I don't care. <laughs> um, so recently there was the, uh, the Apple, what is it, the worldwide de developer something they have when they introduced the, you know, <laughs> the thingy. But anyway, so, so quite recently they, they announced that they will support uh, JPEG XL in Safari, which is a, a very uh, interesting move. So JPEG XL is one of the latest image formats out there, uh, often shortened to just JXL. Um, uh, so yeah, JPEG XL is, was part of Chrome as well. Unfortunately, it got removed, uh, but now it's going to be part of, of Safari. So hopefully other browsers will also, um, also implement that. And JPEG XL is basically an image format that can be used as a JPEG in a classic sense, but it also has so many features that are catered for the web. In fact, it beats WebP, AVIF in, in many, uh, many, many categories. I'm going to leave you a link at the end of the slide where you can read more about the image format uh, because one of my colleagues is, um, was part of the JPEG XL committee, so he put a lot of work into making this image format happen. Um, but we were just very happy to see that, you know, um, Safari now supports this. Okay, so uh, image optimization. So I'm, um, how should we do this? Well, I'm going to walk you through this uh, real quick and then we jump to a demo. Um, so essentially, what you see here is, you know, three URLs. Um, these are images that I've, I uploaded to Cloudinary. So every time you upload an image to a Cloudinary, think of Cloudinary as a uh, image storage optimization transformation and delivery solution. So you upload an image, you get an access URL to access the image. The first link is, you know, the unmodified original. So on my machine, that uh, JPEG file was 583 kilobytes. I uploaded it, got the URL. You load the URL, it's still JPEG, it's still 583 kilobytes. Now, Cloudium has a lot of features, but I'm just going to focus on these two. Uh, Q auto and Q uh, and F auto. So Q auto is automatic quality. F auto is automatic format selection. So just by adding Q auto to the URL, what Cloudinary will do is we will analyze the image, and we're going to reduce the quality of the image in a way that it doesn't affect the human eye. So you will see zero quality reduction, as as far as your you know your eyes can tell, 
But if you load that URL, and you know, if you want, you can take a picture and literally copy these and, and see how they work. Um, it's going to become a 50 kilobyte JPEG, right? Because there's so many, so much data and many pixels that we can remove without affecting the human eye that we gain a lot of savings. And then you add F Auto to that. So F Auto is automatic format selection. So with that, what we do is we look at the browser where the request is coming from, and we say, okay, does this browser support an AVIF? Yes, it does. Then we will actually send the AVIF version. Now, if you take the same URL and you try to open it in a browser that does not support AVIF, we'll send a WebP or a JPEG 2000 or something else that the browser can understand. Okay, so just with these two things, you've achieved hundreds and hundreds of kilobytes uh, in savings. Now, here's an example of that, right? So the, the top one is a, uh, an image that has been manipulated using CSS, so, you know, object fit and width and height and whatnot. And the other one has been manipulated by Cloudinary. And the difference is that the origin is obviously is still 583 kilobytes because the browser has to download the, the actual image and then you just apply CSS to manipulate that image, whereas the bottom one is, um, is the cloud unit version, right? So it's a, an 8.6 kilobyte AVIF. Okay, so quick demo, um, just to show you a couple of tools. So I created a, um, an application here um, I can, or you can take a picture and then you can uh, have a look at the, um, uh, the app itself. And I just want to show you the Performance Insights panel because I think that's what I have time for. So Performance Insights is an experimental panel that you can add in Chrome DevTools. And if you do uh, a measurement here, it's going to measure all the core vital metrics for you. And then we're just going to focus on the largest content for paint. So clearly, the largest content for paint is 4.58 seconds, so that's clearly not good. Um, I let you explore all these features, but you know it highlights you the element, and you can check out what's wrong. But then more importantly, this is the important part here, the timings breakdown. So basically, it gives you these four subparts that I talked to you about, and it tells you, well, your time to first byte is this, your resource load day is that, your resource load time is that. So what you can do now is go and optimize each and every one of these and then see if you can actually reduce them to get a better overall LCP score. So obviously 4.5 seconds is red because it's way over the, the four second limit. And so I've done some optimizations, phew, magic. Um, and then you go back here and then you do another measurement and then you will see that all these numbers uh, would go down and therefore your LCP is now going to be uh, in the green. Okay, so 0 0.14 seconds, and then I didn't remember the, we should have recorded the other numbers, right? But clearly everything went down, everything shrinked, and as such, your overall LCP is also better. Now, one more thing that I'll show you, and then, because I see the warning sign there, um, that says two minutes. Um, so, if you, so if you go into Chrome DevTools and you press, I don't know it on Windows, so I'll just show it to you here, you go to, run command and then you type in core web vitals you will get this uh, rendering overlay called show core web vitals overlay you click it and then now you're going to get this overlay on your site which is going to tell you what your cumulative layout shift is what your largest content for paint is what your first input delays etc etc so it's just good to you know to have this on your site and then you know see these these values Go. Um, okay, so these are the resources. So state of visual media is the uh, report from Cloudinary in terms of you know how many images we served, image format breakdown, etc. Uh, link to Web Almanac, uh, another link to Web.dev, which has an entire section dedicated on uh, image optimization. There's Cloudinary documentation, and then the the last link, which I call Go All In. So Jon Snyers is is the uh, colleague of mine who is a senior image researcher. So Anything that he writes on, a, on the Cloudinary blog is just like, I, I don't even, I don't understand what he's saying, essentially. But, but if you're interested in, you know, very deep dives into image formats and why JPEG works this way and why WebP works that way and quantumization, whatever, everything's in there. So just go and read um, his, his post. Okay, and with that, thank you very much for listening. Do we have time for questions? Okay, we have time for questions.
I answered all the questions. Good. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I just wanted to, could you elaborate on those websites which uh, they have that moving content and what are the examples and why actually they are not uh, as well optimized as they should be? Sorry, websites with moving content? Yeah, yeah, with moving text, sorry. It was at the beginning of your presentation. Uh, oh yeah, that was the cumulative layout shift. Yeah, cumulative layout. So essentially what happens is, so, so cumulative layout shift, so let, let's actually, I'll, I'll answer that in conjunction with images, okay? Because that's what I talked about. So imagine that you have two paragraphs and then you load an image in between them, okay? So if you don't provide the width and the height properties for your image element, the browser will not be able to render the space for the image, right? So what happens if you, if you try to load a page on a slower connection, it's, you know, if you throttle your connection, this is going to be more visible, is that you have the two paragraphs, and when the image has been downloaded and parsed by the browser and it knows the width and the height, it's going to then insert that, right? So what happens to your paragraphs is that they're going to shift, okay? And then the image will, will be placed in between them. So that movement of the paragraphs is what the cumulative layout shift is going to measure. The more the content moves around, the worse your score is going to be. Why? Because if I'm if I'm reading here, right, this this is what I'm reading, the first line in the paragraph, I can't actually, that's difficult, so let's do it this way. So this is the first paragraph that I'm reading, right? And I'm reading that, and now the image comes in, and whew, like where was I? Right? It's very difficult to 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 see. Now a lot of a lot of times this so, so yeah, most of the times this would happen with images with the missing width and height property, but also dynamically injected ads in, in between paragraphs. So very, very common, right? So what Google is trying to do with Discover Web Vitals is, hey, the more your content shifts, the more disturbing it is to your users, so, so it, it's essentially going to penalize you. That's pretty Yeah, much definitely it. it's very annoying, and uh, yeah, some, yep. some blogs and some news websites, they use that, so. Exactly, so that's what the CS is trying to, you know, make sure that it doesn't happen. Thank you. Thank you.